verdad El consuelo en tiempos de tempestad Yo sé que Jesús me amas de verdad Que tú eres fiel y nunca fallarás Que tú eres el camino, la vida y la verdad El consuelo en tiempos de tempestad De Cristo hoy, oh Señor, llénanos de tu amor y de tu paz, que mi vaso en este día tú lo puedas llenar, que desciendas, que Jesucristo es el nombre de mi Dios No hay otro en el cual la redención Que tu vida en mi vida venga a morar Y tus obras pueda yo Manifestar Jesucristo es el nombre de mi Dios Jesucristo es el nombre de mi Dios No hay otro en el cual hay redención Que tu vida en mi vida Si ve obras pueda yo manifestar oh Señor llénanos de tu amor de tu paz que mi vaso en este día tú lo puedas llenar que desciendas que desciendas hasta mi corazón de Cristo hoy oh Señor oh Señor llénanos de tu amor y de tu paz que mi vaso en este día tú lo puedas llenar que desciendas que desciendas De Cristo Y que sea un prisionero De Cristo Y que sea un prisionero De Cristo Venimos a ti Señor en esta hora Para alabar
alabarte, para adorarte Señor como acabamos de cantar Señor nuestro mayor deseo nuestro mayor anhelo es ser prisioneros tuyos Señor por amor que nuestra voluntad Señor nuestra libertad y nuestros derechos queden a un lado Señor y que tú Señor tomes el control de nuestras vidas plenamente Padre tú siendo la paloma que nos está guiando Señor entregamos nuestra voluntad a tu servicio a tus pies y queremos Señor cada instante de nuestras vidas saber que somos prisioneros tuyos Señor que tú nos estás guiando cada instante de nuestra vida Señor por dónde conducir qué hablar, qué pensar qué hacer Señor en esta hora en estos tiempos oscuros Señor donde todo está cayendo a pedazos y nadie tiene tu palabra Señor solamente un puñadito Señor alrededor de la tierra está cayendo está entendiendo claramente tu palabra en esta hora Señor y creemos que somos parte de ellos Señor aquí en este lugar bendice a tus hijos Señor que están congregados en sus casas que han dejado un tiempo Señor para que tú puedas abrir tu palabra y vivificar Señor cada cada escritura que habla de nosotros Señor a través de quinto primer ministerio a través de nuestro pastor Señor que estemos prestos a oír tu palabra Padre como tú dijiste a través de nuestro, de nuestro profeta Señor que estemos al ras de la banca para estar atentos Señor porque nuestra alma está sedienta de ti Señor llénanos más con tu Espíritu Santo mientras que tú nos partes el pan ayuda a cada hijo tuyo Señor que está pasando por necesidades help every son of yours and whatever problems they may be facing sickness economic problems mental battles help every son of yours become real in our midst please Lord We need more of you each day. Your leadership, like we just sang, we want to be prisoners of yours. Bless us with a wonderful service. We worship you, Lord. We ask you these things in your precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Glory to the Lord. Hallelujah. No sé cómo, no sé por qué. No puedo explicar el gran amor de Dios por mi alma. Aleluya. I don't know how, I don't know sí, why. Señor. I can't explain the love of God. En sus casas cántelo con todo su corazón. Amén. My soul. Sing it at home. Más allá de esta carne y debilidades que ahora ves. Una conexión invisible con Jesucristo. No sé cómo, no sé por qué, no puedo explicar el amor de Dios por mi alma, pero dentro de mí al oír su palabra, mi alma dice. Digo amén Más allá de esta carne Y debilidades que ahora ves Hay una conexión invisible Con Jesucristo No sé cómo no sé por qué no puedo explicar el gran amor de Dios por mi alma. Aleluya. Mi alma dice, digo amén. Él dijo que seré perfecto con la virtud. 
desnudez de Jesucristo Pero a mi alrededor aún veo imperfección Se a mí por el diablo Mi enemigo quiere ponerme triste Y deprimido y atarme aquí Pero me paro en mis dos pies lo miro al directo a los ojos y digo No sé cómo, no sé por qué No puedo explicar el amor de Dios por mi alma Pero dentro de mí, al oír su palabra Mi alma dice amén Digo amén No sé cómo, no sé por qué No puedo explicar el amor de Dios por mi alma Pero dentro de mí al oír su palabra Mi alma dice amén Digo amén Me dijo que seré rata cielo y descubrí la séptima dimensión puedo sentir la fuerza de gravedad tratando de jalarme a esa tierra y atarme aquí pero me paro en mis dos pies alzo mis manos desafiando la gravedad No sé cómo, no sé por qué, no puedo explicar el gran amor de Dios por mi alma. Al oír su palabra, mi alma dice, digo amén. No sé cómo, no sé por qué, no puedo explicar. El amor de Dios por mi alma Pero dentro de mí al oír su palabra Me dice Digo amén Digo amén Digo amén Digo amén Señor, aleluya. Sí, Padre, nuestra alma dice amén a tu palabra, Señor. Aleluya. Sí, Señor. Muchas veces sí. Dios ha hablado aquí de distintas formas y sazón, pero en esta edad su promesa dio de sacar un pueblo al eterno. He vivido sí, esperando ese momento y todo mi ser está descansando en su palabra. Sacará de aquí Nunca oí De una promesa igual De la eternidad un día Volverá un carruaje Y a su presencia 
presencia ángeles me llevarán fueron muchos los que anhelaron ser parte de esta novia del final hermano pero él escogió un pueblo especial Y amaría su palabra hasta el final Y no importa cuál Tu tarde su venida Presencia, ángeles me llevará y a su presencia, ángeles me llevará. Ten fe, no te preocupes Sé que todo va a estar bien Esto mortal se vestirá de inmortalidad Ya no seremos terrenales Sino celestiales Vamos de tiempo Ten fe, no te preocupes Sé que todo va a estar bien Esto mortal se vestirá de inmortalidad Ya no seremos terrenales Sino celestiales Vamos de tierra del viejo hombre y me revisto del nuevo hombre cambiando vestiduras para otra dimensión del viejo errores debo alistar mi lámpara que brille fuerte mi 
llama hermano porque yo no quiero problemas a llegar al río yo quiero estar listo puede venir nuestro pastor al otro lado y me despojo del viejo hombre me revisto nuevo Debo alistar mi lámpara Que brille fuerte Mi llama Porque Yo no quiero problemas A llegar al río Yo quiero estar listo Para cruzar Despojo del viejo hombre me revisto El nuevo hombre cambiando Vestiduras para otra dimensión Me despojo del viejo hombre me revisto Del nuevo hombre cambiando Vestiduras Estamos en la voz Muy pronto Sonará la trompeta Del viejo hombre Y me revisto El nuevo hombre cambiando Blessed Heavenly Father, we bow our heads to you this morning, our good Father. To bless you, to thank you, we bow down to your feet. We offer our heart, all of our being, we surrender to you. We understand. Father, this is the most glorious time that has been promised to your church, the time where you yourself would come down, where you, in your body of flesh, the corporal 
body that with which you were born through that body of, of Mary, uh, not in the flesh, but it would be you, your own ministry. You said it would be the reincarnated ministry, everything except the physical body. It would be the mystical body. Father, we want to surrender that that purpose, that that ministry of yours may be expressed faithfully. We pray, Lord, that all of our doubts, our mistakes, our faults may all be put to the side. We confess our limitation. We confess our inability, and by your grace, we, we submerged ourselves in the, in the bleach of your blood. We live in this time where judgment is increasing and we need you not just for us in our soul there is no fear to be taken to hell that has been removed from us but in in the in in our heart is still the desire to serve you better there's still a cry in us that we haven't served you the way you deserve to be served we ask that you may help us. You may help us to be so surrendered that we may fulfill even the, the least of your desires. We want to fulfill it. When we remember back then those courageous men that went to the well of Bethlehem to bring a fresh drink of water for their king, they didn't consider the risk that existed. They risk their lives to bring a drink of water for their king if that was the shadow of the true mighty warriors of this hour if that was the shadow of how the desire of a king can put so much burden so much surrender into the subjects lord how much more would it be today for us when you are our king and when your desire is to reach the last predestinated seed when your desire is to bring the promised revival for the righteous grant that we may consecrate our lives surrender to that purpose spend it in that purpose forgive us because until this point we haven't done it the way it should be but help us father we come to your presence once more as members of your mystical body offering you, offering ourselves to you for the hour for which you called us in the position that you, Lord, predestinated and, and assigned us here as preachers, sound engineers, musicians, singers, those in charge of the transmission, homemakers, housewives, children, elders, people that pray, people that fast. Lord, in the position you've given us, help us to fulfill your ministry. While we come to your word, Lord, may it be you. You bring your word. Place your word in our hearts. Make it operate according to your will. Grant that we may be those trees planted beside living waters whose leaves never fall and, and give fruit in due season. We offer ourselves to you, Father. And we remember that in your word, are all the things we need to complete our journey. Absolutely everything. If, if we need wisdom, advice, correction, exhortation, all of that is in your word. If we need healing, healing is in your word. Grant that your word may 
go out in such a way that it may reach the heart of every son of yours, according to the need, according to the reality that they find themselves in. Break the bread in such a way that everyone may be satisfied, that we may receive from you what we need to serve you, to offer you a service according to your will. We don't want to give you a service according to what pleases us. We want to offer you a service according to your perfect will. For we know that you call us to be vessels of honor. We offer ourselves to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen and amen. Glory to the Lord. Hallelujah. All right, my brothers, let's uh, continue still uh, meditating on the same subject. The Mysteries of Redemption, written in the book of Ruth. And let's return to chapter 3 of the book of Ruth to have a talk, just a quick talk on this wonderful book of Ruth that has impressed our hearts so much. Just a talk. All right. If we could be half an hour, I, I would be happy with that. Uh, let's wait on the Lord. So, just a little more here. Chapter 3 of the book of Ruth. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said unto her, In Reina Valera Gomez, it's closer to the King James Version. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said unto her, My daughter, shall I not seek rest for thee? Rest for thee? In Spanish, it says, a home. But as we keep on reading, we find that the word rest here is marriage. So we find that rest for the bride for the lamb's wife for us it is found in the revelation of marriage when Naomi is teaching Ruth these things she's saying that the place of rest the resting place is marriage and she's saying in chapter 3 she's saying now it's important that we understand that these things are happening in chapter 3 and now I'm going to make the comment Chapter 3 is where Naomi says to Ruth, I'll find a home for you, rest for thee. My daughter, shall I not seek rest for thee, a home for you, that it may be well with thee? And now is it, and now is not Boaz of our kindred, with whose maidens thou wast? Behold, he went with barley to, tonight in the threshing floor. Wash thyself therefore and anoint thee and put thy raiment, in other versions it says thy best raiment, upon thee and get thee down to the floor. But make th not thyself known unto the man until he shall have done eating and drinking. And it shall be when he lieth down that thou shall mark the place where he shall lie and thou shalt go in and uncover his feet and lay thee down and he will tell thee what thou shalt do. And she said unto her, All that thou sayest unto me I will do. You may be seated. So I'm telling you that this chapter 3, it's important that we understand where it's happening. This book of Ruth is the book of redemption. This book of Ruth, in these chapters I told you in, in the last meeting, I think I was telling you, people criticize the book of Daniel so much because they think that it's not true that he prophesied the coming of the Greeks, the coming of the Roman Empire, they say it's impossible. It's impossible that a man could anticipate so many years to what's going to happen to humanity. Well, that, that wasn't a man. So they say, no, this has to be that some things Daniel wrote while he was alive, other men wrote them as they were being fulfilled. They can't realize that was the God of prophecy the God that knows the end from the beginning. 
And when we come to the book of Ruth, no one pays attention on the fact that the book of Ruth is also a prophetic book and that in the book of Ruth are, are contained the prophecies that span all the way until the millennium, until when Jesus is called the King of Kings. They can't see those things. Why? Because it's written in a way that it only seems like a romantic novel, a, a story of love. So people can't criticize it because they say, no, it's a nice love story. But when the Holy Ghost answers into the details, you find that this is a 100% prophecy. It's not just a love story, but it's a prophecy that was destined to wake, to illuminate the heart with faith for the end-time bride. So, when you come to the book of Ruth, to chapter 3, you have to know that prior to that, prior to that, in, in, the, in the previous verses, it was saying that Ruth was working until the barley harvest was finished and the wheat harvest was finished and then she was waiting. Now, you know, after the harvest, it's speaking of two seasons. You know that the barley harvest happens in the first threefold feast. The first threefold feast in the book of Leviticus 23. Leviticus 23 speaks to us of how there is a first great threefold feast. That's Passover, unleavened bread, and the first fruits. All of that happened in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ in his first three and a half years. The feast of the first fruits is the, the Sunday of resurrection. It's the barley grain, the first sheaves that are waved. And then after that, it says how she was until the end of the wheat harvest. That's at the Feast of Pentecost, which happened 50 days after the first uh, sheaf that was waved. So it's speaking of a, a time period of about two months, because after that you have the barley harvested, reaped, the wheat already harvested, reaped. The church ages are finished. Pay attention. That's why I want you to realize when Jesus speaks of the parable of the wheat and the barley, or rather the wheat and the tares, not the barley. When he speaks of the parable of the wheat and the tares, not the barley, they, the disciples or the servants said, did you not plant wheat? Why do we find tares? Do you want us to root them out? No, let them grow together. In the time of the reaping, I will tell the reapers, in the harvest time, I'll tell the reapers, gather first the tares, bind them in bundles, and then gather the wheat. So he's saying, the reaping, the harvest, is the end of the world. So when the barley harvest has finished and the wheat harvest has finished, the reaping of the wheat, that's the, the end of the world. The end of the world is the seventh age. So it's telling us here in chapter 3, it's saying that the seven ages, this is going to happen at the end of the church ages. When the seventh church age has already come to the scene and not just come to the scene but now the rapture is about to happen that's why in chapter 3 it is also said um, that Naomi is saying I want you to go to where Boaz is because he's going to fan what, what does that mean to winnow to winnow or to fan it means the threshing uh, is finished. The ox already threshed. They, they already stepped on, on the grain. The, the stage of the ox stepping on the, on the grain to separate the grain from the, from the shaft, from the shuck, to make a final separation, and then the grain will be taken into the storehouse or to the barn. That's exactly where it's placing us. When we understand that, when we understand that, we have to know where we are standing. I was listening, I think I said it here. Some brothers say, right, five years ago, you said the same thing when the pandemic began. You said the same thing, that we're close, that it might be this year, and if we pass this year, it'll be a miracle. Brother, can't we realize, can't, can't we recognize it truly is a miracle that we've been here two years? Why is it that the Lord hasn't made the rapture, hasn't, made us be taken out of here and, and taken to the marriage supper. Don't you realize it's the grace of God extending 
stretching forth to reach those that haven't reached maturity? It's not that the Lord is delaying that we made a mistake. It's the grace of the Lord extended. Do you know what? Do you know that these two years of pandemic have been? It's the grace of the Lord, the abundance of the Lord, super abundance, trying to say, I, I, I'm giving you time to be ready to enter into the right condition. It's not that it's a delay. It's not like Brother Ever made a mistake and these fanatics that thought this is the squeeze. No, brothers. This is only the grace of the Lord giving us time to fulfill our work that we may be in the right conditions to go into the marriage supper. That's what has happened. It's not, no, Brother Ever is wrong. These fanatics are wrong, saying that the time is already here. No, we haven't made a mistake. We're not doubting. We're not shaking, thinking, what are people going to say? Truly, that's why I'm showing you, I'm showing you, you have to go to the Bible and find where you're standing. We're here. We're in the threshing floor. And when the bride realizes these things, look at the indications that Naomi gives to Ruth. Now this here happened after Naomi. This happened after Naomi asked Ruth, where were you? Ruth, where where did you reap? Who who were you working with? She said, well, there was a, a reaper, a chief reaper that welcomed me, then the owner, then I came to find out they, they loved this man, respected this man so much. He's the most powerful man in Bethlehem, the richest man in Bethlehem. He came in a white horse. He came to talk to the chief reaper. He had so much respect. I, I was confused. I thought the chief reaper was the owner, but it turns out he was just the chief reaper. When when the owner came, the owner of all things, he came down off the horse. They respected him so much. I find, found out his name was Boaz. Those are the things that Ruth is bringing as a report to Naomi. So when... Naomi heard the name of that man, the name of the owner of the field that Ruth had been gleaning in. Naomi exploded in, in excitement, jubilee, and, and, and Ruth didn't know why. What, just by saying Boaz? Just because she said Boaz? Naomi began to shout, and that old lady that couldn't even walk almost, she she shouted. She had a Pentecostal service shouting and jumping just because she heard the name of Boaz. What a, what a virtue was in the name of Boaz that this Naomi would enter into a, a service of that category. So now Ruth would be thinking, what, what did I say? And so now Naomi says, no, my daughter, what happens is that this is our kinsman. This is one of the one, ones that can redeem me. Until that moment, Ruth didn't know anything about what redemption was. She was just there just to survive. She thought that she came to survive. She thought she came to take care of her mother-in-law. Of course, with everything, we know that she said she came to serve the God that Naomi served, but she didn't know much. She didn't know much about those things. Like I told you, like us, when we came... We thought we knew so much when we said God sent a prophet and biblical baptism and the serpent seed to us. That was a, a knowledge like who like us, but that's just the foundation. Nothing against those things. We can break anyone to pieces with that, but that, that wasn't it. That's just the rudiments. So now Naomi begins to say, no, this is one of our redeemers. This is someone that can redeem us now. Ruth begins to hear the doctrine of, of redemption. And Naomi is excited because she knows, according to Leviticus 25, 25, there's a law that poor people can recover all their inheritance, all their inheritance, their land, the trees, everything they had. They can take it back if the near kinsman pays the debt, purchases the things if he wants to redeem them. So she's saying he's the one that can redeem the inheritance, the inheritance of Elimelech. 
So she's happy for that. And she he, she continued working. You read uh, chapter 2. She continued working those two months, more than two months. And when the time of the reaping, the harvest passed, now the time of the rapture was going to happen because gathering the grain after it, it's been threshed to take it to the storehouse, that's the rapture, that's the trumpet of God. There's been a, a shout which was in chapter 2. And there's going to be a trumpet of God, a trump of God. So between the shout and the trump of God, this is happening, this story. In chapter 3, you don't see the, the chief reaper appear anymore. You don't see him appear. Now it's the story of Ruth and Boaz. It's Ruth and Boaz working. This is after the ministry of Revelation 10.7. This is after the ministry of the Son of Man being made known through one man. And now it's the ministry of the Son of Man reaching her, reaching Ruth. A body, a mystical body, not just one man. That's chapter 3. So he's speaking to her, teaching her. We're understanding where we are. That's why in this stage, there's so much criticism saying that we don't want to believe in the message of the prophet anymore, that we're making up a different message. None of those things. But you have to, you have to understand the book of redemption. When you go and you hear what the prophet says in the, in the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ, he says how Ruth is the book of redemption. There's a mystery hidden there. When he reaches the breach between the ages and the seals, he speaks again on how the book of Ruth is the book of redemption and is hiding these mysteries for the end time. So people can't understand. They can't realize how chapter 2 spoke to us about the ministry of the angel of the seventh age. And in chapter 3, that ministry isn't there anymore. Why? Chapter 2 and chapter 3 is speaking of Revelation 10. Those two cycles, the, the two folds. The first fold is the mighty angel Boaz dealing with the chief reaper. And the second cycle, the second fold of Revelation 10 of the seventh seal is the mighty angel speaking with Ruth. Revelation 10, 8 through 11. So people can't understand that. They can't realize that the angel that came to speak with the prophet of Revelation 10, 7 can't come to teach a different message to Ruth of Revelation 10, 8 through 11. He comes teaching the same message, just that one part had to do with Malachi 4, 5, the fourth Elijah, and another part has to do with the people to whom Elijah was sent. One part had to do with the chief reaper, and the other part had to do with the reaper that taught Ruth. So there's no confusion. You just realize in the book of Ruth, no one is saying, when you read the book of Ruth, no one is saying, no, here, Ruth made a mistake. She should have kept speaking with the chief reaper. No, she should have continued saying that the chief reaper and the chief reaper, she should have said to Boaz, Boaz, wait a minute, let me speak with the chief reaper first. That's when you notice how people in this hour accuse us that we don't believe in Brother Branham, they're not realizing that they are denying chapter 3. They have, they've crossed out Ruth chapter 3. That part doesn't exist. So then why is it placed there? It's identifying our story. That's so that we don't stumble, so that we wouldn't be afraid saying that we left the message. We're exactly in the Bible. Amen? So now you realize that Ruth wakes up not only to the blessings of the Redeemer, Ruth now in chapter 3, she wakes up not only to the blessings of the Redeemer that can give her wheat or that can give her barley, that can give her uh, parched corn, that can give her water, that can give her some handfuls of the sheaves, not just treating her nicely. Now she wakes up to another stage of redemption. In chapter 3, she enters into another stage. She's going to wake up to another stage of redemption that she didn't know anything about. 
in chapter two, she's happy because she bypassed the stage of misery. She's no longer dying of hunger, neither her nor her mother-in-law. But now in chapter three, she's going to give a, a jump, a quantum jump to the nth power change of category. Why? Why will there be a change of category? category because the illumination of her understanding is going to take her millions and millions of light years above where she was she was a a beggar but now you're going to see the revelation that reaches her in chapter three in chapter three now she receives a special conversation of naomi and remember that naomi is the old testament the shadow we can talk about her like the hebrew church but it's also the Old Testament where we find the shadows, the instructions for the Gentile church that was going to come, which is us. So Ruth, the Gentile, begins to find in the shadows the instructions to know how she has to behave in this hour, in this hour. In what hour? When the harvest is finished. When the grain is going to be taken to the storehouse. When we're about to be taken out into the rapture. In that hour, when the rapture is about to take place, this is the great illumination that that enlightens the understanding of Ruth. Na Naomi says, Daughter, my daughter, shall I not find a, a place of rest for thee, a house, a husband? But in chapter 1, she said, why are, you, why are you going to follow me to my land? I don't have another son for you to marry. There's a law that the widow, if, if a girl... It becomes a widow without giving sons. She has to marry uh, her brother-in-law and the brother-in-law will raise a son for the dead husband. But she says, my daughter, I have no more children. And even if I were to go there and get married and have a son, would you still wait for me, wait for him, for that son to grow up so you can marry? There's no hope. There's no opportunity for you. You just stay here. Stay with your God. Stay with your family. Naomi didn't want to or Ruth, rather, didn't want to. And you see how it says in the book of Ruth, chapter 2, when Boaz says to her, I know you came to rest, to trust under the wings of the God, the shadow of the wings of the God of Israel. Now in chapter 3, after Naomi said there was no hope for her to get married, now she comes to tell her that there is a hope. In chapter 3, now in chapter 3, she opens another stage that opens an expectation that was never in the heart of Ruth. Of course, she already fell in love with Boaz. Boaz already fell in love with her. But until this point, Boaz hasn't said anything. Boaz hasn't said, you know, I'm going to do this and that and the other. All Boaz has done is supply her all, with all her needs. And in chapter 3, now Naomi after Ruth is conscious that Boaz has supplied all her needs, has provided her with all things, all the things that she had need of, health, food, clothing, shoes, all those things were provided by Boaz, just like with us. But now in chapter 3, Naomi's going to reveal something to Ruth that she hadn't understood all that time. And now she says, Ruth, I'm going to look for a husband for you. I'm going to look for a partner. Rest. I'm going to find a good place for you to get married. And then she says, isn't it Boaz? Who was Naomi thinking of? Who was Naomi thinking that Ruth was going to marry? She's saying, I will seek a way. There's a way for you to get married. God has brought us here. And you will get married, and the person you will marry is Boaz. I'm thinking about Boaz. That's what Naomi's... Naomi isn't thinking about any other person. So she's opening this way. She's opening this way to, to Ruth and saying, He's our Redeemer. When she spoke those things, you have to understand, she had to enter into the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 25. I'm going to read it to you now. I think we read it last meeting. Deuteronomy 25, 25. It says, like, it says on this wise. It says, I think we did read it. Uh, 
Leviticus 25, 25. If thy brother be waxen poor and hath sold away some of his possession, and if any of his kin come to redeem it, then shall he redeem that which his, which his brother sold. And if the man have none to redeem it and himself be able to redeem it, then let him count the years of the sale thereof and restore the overplus unto the man to whom he sold it, that he may return unto his possession. But if he be not able to restore it to him, then that which is sold shall remain in the hand of him that hath bought it until the year of jubilee. And in the jubilee it shall go out, and he shall return unto his possession. And if a man sell a dwelling house in a walled city, then he may redeem it within a whole year after it is sold. Within a full year may he redeem it. And if it be not redeemed within the space of a full year, then the house that is in the walled city shall be established for ever to him that bought it throughout his generations. It shall not go out in the jubilee. The advice that Naomi brought to Ruth, she said, he's the one that can redeem. It's, it was in Deuteronomy 25, verse 5. That's where he was reading. Naomi's revealing to Ruth that she has a right with Boaz, saying, he's our redeemer, our kinsman redeemer. our near kinsman, one that is worthy, that has the ability, that wants to, he has to have the will to redeem. It's Boaz. And she's saying these things to Ruth. When is this, when are these things happening? Now I want you to notice if, if in chapter 2, when Naomi discovered that Boaz was the one that was attending to Ruth, Produce that shout of, of joy. You have to know now in chapter 3, when Ruth is in love with Boaz, but she knows it's an impossible love. Now when Naomi comes and says, I want to explain to you, Ruth, that there is a law by which this man that you're in love with and this man that is in love with you, I want you to know that there's a law that God already opened, that God already knew the future, God already knew this situation, and he left a law in the Old Testament so that when you would need a redeemer, that you would marry this man that you love. That law, God wrote it in Deuteronomy 25. He wrote it for you, Ruth. God already opened a way. He knew you were going to come from Moab. God knew you were going to become a widow. He knew you were going to go through this need. He knew you were going to be a beggar. And God knew this would be the season at the end of the harvest when you would have to discover that he's the one that can marry you. When that was spoken to Ruth, now you can imagine how she, who thought she was lost, that she was going to be a beggar, that there was no future for her in the fields of Bethlehem in the land of Judah. Now, when she said, he can marry you, he's your kinsman, he can become your husband, you can become Mrs. Boaz. Can you imagine now the, the shout of jubilee that was in her? You say, that's not written there, brother, but you have to go to Revelation chapter 5. And in Revelation chapter 5, you're going to find Ruth. When you go to Revelation 5, you find Ruth. Let's go there so that you see this that I'm t talking to you about. Revelation 5. I'm going to read quickly Deuteronomy 25, verse 5. If brethren dwell together and one of them die and have no child, the wife of the dead shall not marry without unto a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go in unto her and take her to him to wife and perform the duty of of an husband's brother unto her. In Revelation, now, this is in the time of the of the harvest uh, when the threshing already happened. The chaff has been separated. This chapter 4, after this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither. That's the rapture. But in chapter 5, so that we know what happened for the grain to go up, what took place for the grain to be taken to the storehouse, chapter 5. 
And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. What is that book? The book of redemption. Deuteronomy 25, verse 5 onwards. This is the kins kinsman that can marry you in that hour. The need to find a kinsman. You're going to find when the mystery was opened. What was it? It says... And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and loose, to loose the, se the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. That's Ruth. Ruth in her condition. No one can redeem her. Well, she has food, but that's going to be her condition. She's going to remain there forever. Everything will remain like that. Elimelech won't recover his inheritance. Malone won't recover his name. Naomi won't recover her inheritance. They have food, but that's as far as they will go. And verse 4 says, And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. That is the feeling of John and of Ruth within. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seals, the seven seals thereof. That's Deuteronomy 25. Shall I not find rest, a partner, marriage? Weep not. Shall I not seek rest for thee? And then he opens. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, that's because he wanted to. Now here, I want, I want you to notice how... Here is the will of the Redeemer to take the book. There is one that is worthy, but now he has to have the will to take it. So when you return to the book of Ruth, you find how Naomi says, he's the one that can redeem us. He's the one that can marry you. Now she says, but I want you to do what I indicate. Don't move from any other place. She already knows I'm going to return here to the book of Revelation if the Lord allows me. But she knows, now Ruth already knows, Ruth already knows that Boaz is her uh, near kinsman. But she has to find a way, remember, all of this depends on Boaz marrying her. It all depends on that. It could be that he may not want to, but it all depends. Now we know the book, but I'm telling you, it all depends on Boaz wanting to marry her just like we would say it all depends on God wanting to receive us not that we are in love with him but it depends on him being in love with us that's what it depends on will he accept me that is the question right the question would be would he want to accept me does the Lord love me am I the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ but, but that answer is already given that's why the Lord went to the cross of Calvary. That's why you see in Revelation 5, it says he turned to, to see the lion of the tribe of Judah and he saw the lion that had died for her, paid for her. It's not if he loves me. He loves me, definitely. He proved it to me. That's why he's clearing these things up to me and telling me, fear not. I already did all these things for you. 2,000 years ago, I demonstrated my love. Glory to the Lord. So, now here, Naomi begins to explain. She's speaking now of the reality that she finds herself in. And in verse 2, she says, And now, is it not Boaz of our kindred or our near kinsman? She's explaining that in Deuteronomy 25, it says the kinsman has to marry the widow because she didn't have a child. To do what? To perform the duty of a husband's brother unto her. And through that son, all the inheritance shall be returned. The land 
that God gave, it all depends on the brother-in-law wanting to marry her. Remember the story of Tamar? How Judah had a son, and then Tamar married the first son, and before they had a child, the first son died, and then according to the law, this same Leverett law, then she married the brother-in-law, and then he died too. When it was time to, to marry the youngest son, Judah didn't want to because she said, this woman is cursed. All my sons die because they marry her. I'm not going to give her my last son. So no, no, no. I'm. He didn't want to give uh, her to the last son. So what did Tamar do? Why? The revelation came to Tamar and she said, if Judah doesn't have a son, then the lion of the tribe of Judah, which is promised that would come, the son of David that would sit in the millennium, how would he come? The The promise is, is going to be broken since he's a widow. He doesn't have a, a wife. The only chance for the lineage of Judah to be preserved is for me to be pregnant, is for Judah to have a son, and the only opportunity is for him to have the son with me. That was Tamar's decision. And she didn't care. Tamar didn't care to put her own reputation. She was a clean woman. Her to put her reputation on the line. She didn't. She didn't care that they would speak badly about her as long as the desire of the Lord would be fulfilled. That in Judah the scepter would be. The people would gather to him. She said, "It doesn't matter what I have to do. If if I have to be looked at." Like a harlot, I'm the woman that's willing to make sure that the inheritance of Judah isn't lost. And she dresses a harlot, she slept with Judah, and she bore, she uh, had a son. And the lineage of Judah continued through her, because she understood the promise of the inheritance to the throne, the Redeemer is in Judah. So she didn't care to behave as a harlot. So when this girl that receives the revelation. This girl receives the revelation that it's through her that Naomi would receive her her inheritance if Boaz wants to marry her. I want you to notice Boaz is going to redeem Naomi because he loves the Gentile. It's not that Boaz it's not that Boaz wanted the inheritance of Elimelech. No. Boaz wanted Ruth. And out of love for Ruth, he redeemed everything that Elimelech had. Do you understand? He Boaz loved Ruth so much that he redeemed everything. Do you realize that the people that will receive eternal life in the great white throne, the foolish, the blessed, all those people, they'll receive eternal life because God wanted to redeem a Gentile? Do you realize all those people that will be saved and will receive eternal life in the great white throne, all of that is because God loved a Gentile? God loved, Boaz loved Ruth so much that he wanted to save and recover everything. Brother Random says, John wept because even all creation would return to its original state. Everything would be lost. But God loved Ruth, his bride, so much that even the creation itself groaneth for the manifestation of Ruth. It's out of love for Ruth that everything will be saved, that everything will be preserved. And so now this Naomi says, I want you to do everything that I tell you. Behold, he went with barley tonight in the threshing floor. Wash thyself therefore and anoint thee and put thy raiment upon thee and get thee down to the floor. Not the field, the floor, the threshing floor where the, the grain has been threshed already. But, but make not thyself known unto the man until he shall have done eating and drinking. So she was going to be watching him. He had to have finished eating. She had, he had to have finished eating, drink. Well, and, and said, well, boys, I'm going to go to... Uh, Rest, she was watching him. 
And it shall be when he lieth down that thou shalt mark the place where he shall lie, and thou shalt go in and uncover his feet and lay thee down. She had to know where he had died, where he had slept. Wasn't that at Calvary? Then you will go to Calvary too. That's called dying to our own selves. Like the prophet preached, our day at Calvary. We have to die to our own aspirations, our own desires, just like Tamar. Like Tamar, who was willing to lose her own reputation. She could have said, well, isn't there another way to do things, a more decent way, uh, less shameful? How am I going to go into this man's room? How can I go and, and ask for the key of the hotel and go into there to the bed? And No, I can't do that. Do you understand? That's what Naomi's asking here. To go into the room of this man. To go to the bed. But she's being taught. She knows that this is according to the law. This is according to the word. And you're seeing where she says to lay down. She doesn't, she doesn't say lay next to him. No, at his feet. That means submission, subordination. She's willing to place herself where the word says that she has to be placed. So that's exactly what Ruth did. She didn't care. What is that called? The scripture says, let me look for that in the Bible. If any pretends, if any wants to save their life, they'll lose it. I'm going to read from Deuteronomy 25 again. Verse 6. And it shall be that the firstborn which she beareth shall succeed in the name of his brother which is dead, that his name be not put out of Israel. Matthew sixteen twenty four. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? We can't operate here according to our own will. Ruth could argue and present different options, but Ruth only accepted what the Word said. If the Word wants us to do something, let's do it. If the Word doesn't want us to do something, don't do it. Let's do what the Scripture says. We have entered into this plan of redemption, and God has something for us. The Redeemer, the Redeemer, hasn't He proven to Ruth that He can give her barley, He can give her food, He can give her water, that He can give her provisions for her mother-in-law? Didn't he prove it already? It's already proved. That's already proved from chapter 2. Hasn't God proven that he's been able to sustain us all these years? Hasn't he given us food, family, uh, partners, husbands, wives? Passed through. He, he allowed us to pass through trials that it seemed like we couldn't pass. Allowed us to remain here after so many faults and errors when we thought we couldn't continue. Even when we thought there was no forgiveness for us, God brought us until this point. So if God brought us until this point, now that the word says, I will do something for you that you didn't even imagine, I'm going to call you to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Won't he do that for us? Of course. Let's just be willing to surrender our lives. Let's give up our lives. What he said he'll do for us, that's what he will do. No, but brother, now if we don't have the vaccination card, if we don't get vaccinated, we won't be able to study. Can he not open a door to study if he wants? No, we won't be able to travel. Will he not open a door to travel if he wants us to travel? No, but I won't be able to go to the mall. Will he not open a door for you to go to the mall if he wants you to go to the mall? Wasn't it in the Garden of Gethsemane? He himself said, Lord, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. If there's any other way to do it, if I can obtain a false vaccination card. Wasn't it so? What did he say? 
but let it let it not be my will, Lord, but let it thy will be done. It's exactly the same here. Just that it seems like the vaccination card has nothing to do with it. It seems like the vaccine has nothing to do with it. This is the day. This is the day where Ruth had to appear, where they had to be offering the vaccine, where they had to be offering a, a false vaccination card. This is the day when the shepherds say, no, there's no problem with getting vaccinated. It has nothing to do with the faith. The prophet got vaccinated. This is the day. Ruth has to know. This is exactly what was prophesied to her. So when she discovered that and she was willing to give up her own life, like the Hebrew boys, the Hebrew boys, were they not willing to give up their own lives? Like Daniel, was he not willing to give up his own life? Like Esther, wasn't she willing to give up her own life? Like Tamar, wasn't she willing to give up her own reputation? All of that is talking about this hour. When was it? In the darkest hour, you find here it says at night. No one knew what was happening. The world doesn't know what's happening. But Ruth does know. Ruth is moving according to the indications of the word. The world is blind. But the bride is not. The bride knows what she's doing. She knows why she's doing all these things. She knows it. Do you think she she fell asleep at the feet of Boaz? Think about it. Do you think Ruth said she laid down and she said, oh, "I'm going to I'm going to take a nap." She didn't sleep. She was there in expectation. What's going to happen? What's going to happen? And all of a sudden, when Boaz was cold, he wanted to stretch and he felt her. Immediately he woke up. He said, "What's going on here?" Imagine how her heart must be, Ruth's. She didn't get vaccinated. She didn't have heart troubles, but it was the experience. Verse 6. And she went down unto the floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law bade her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of corn. And she came softly and uncovered his feet and laid her down. And it came to pass at midnight that the man was afraid and turned himself. And behold, a woman lay at his feet. And he said, Who art thou? And she answered, I am Ruth, thine handmaid. Spread therefore thy skirt over thine handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. Now, you realize the access that she comes with? When he asks, who are you? I remember, I remember once. Now this could, could seem irrelevant, right? But I remember when I was in, de in the denomination and... Um, we had what was supposed to be the gift of prophecy and so they called this gift of supposedly the gift of prophecy called an evangelist there from the denomination and supposedly the gift of prophecy the registering angel was there and the evangelist when the Lord spoke to him supposedly the Lord spoke to him so he would say write down angel write down that was the evangelist right Angel, write down, I need this and that, the other and the other. That guy didn't even know what it was to be in the presence of an angel. What a... Do you think that was Ruth's attitude? You think that was Ruth's attitude where she, when she went there? Remember when, um, when David was fleeing and then that man began to cast stones and spit and say, uh, that dog insulting David. Do you think that was Ruth's attitude? A Ru uh, uh, an attitude of, of pride when she, find out, when she found out he was her kinsman, kicking him to get him to wake up. And then when he woke up, I'm Ruth, marry me. Do you think that was the way she did it? 
Boaz, look, here it says, Deuteronomy 25. It says here, right here, you have to marry the widow of your brother. I'm the widow, so come on, let's go. You have to marry me. You think that's the way? Do you see yourself speaking to the Lord that way? Have you ever seen yourself speaking to the Lord like that? Hey, Lord, come on. What's going on? Have you ever done something like that? So now imagine how Ruth must have been. How must she be at, 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 at his feet saying, I'm thine handmaiden. Please spread thy, thy skirt over thine handmaid. You can see in the book of Genesis how when God, the judge, came down and spoke to Cain and gave the sentence, he said, that's not right. That's not right. That's too much. Do you think that was Ruth's attitude? It wasn't Ruth's attitude, just like Tamar's attitude. When Tamar laid with Judah and, and Judah said, this woman is a harlot, she's been unfaithful. What was Tamar's attitude? You shameless man, you come and pretend you're a Christian and you went to the brothel and you, you slept with me and thinking I was a harlot, you were the one that should die. No, it wasn't like that. Do you realize what Tamar said? Tamar said, go and give these things to Judah and tell him that the father of the child is the owner of these things. Do you realize the access, the respect, the approach to God? Or like when the prophet says that he said to the woman, Jesus said to the woman, this bread is for the children. The woman could have exploded and said, you know, but no, instead she said, yes, Lord, you're right. But the dogs, they they watch, they, they're there at, at the children's table waiting for, for a a crumb to fall off the table. Oh, I have not found so this faith in Israel. Receive what you ask for. You Look at Ruth's attitude. I am thine handmaid. Spread therefore thy skirt or thy robe over, over me. You're the kinsman that can marry me. What, what do you think happened with Boaz? Now, do you see the access she has? You see the understanding she has, the revelation she has? But it doesn't produce pride. It doesn't produce boasting. Vain glory. She has security. She has confidence, but she has respect. Do you see how in the book of Isaiah, the cherubims, how they have three pairs of wings? Two to cover their face, meaning reverence. Two to cover the feet, humility. And two to fly, meaning to enter into, into uh, to work, labor. Do you think Ruth entered without reverence? Without humility? Reverence, humility, things that will always be with us. Where were we? For thou art a near kinsman. You're the one that can marry me. You're the one that can raise a seat for my husband. Verse 10. And he said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my daughter. You see the expression now? That's what God says to us. Jesus said to us, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my daughter, for thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning, inasmuch as thou followest not young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, fear not. See, what is he saying to us? Fear not. Don't be afraid. You ask me to redeem you? Fear not. Fear not. I will do to thee all that thou requirest. You ask me to redeem you? I will redeem you. You ask me to marry you? I will marry you. If Ruth achieved that from Boaz, what can the bride achieve now? Why did he say, all that you ask the Father, I will do? Why? No, he won't give me what I ask. What are you going to ask him, a car? What are you going to ask him for? Lord, I want to go to the mall 
Is that what you're going to ask for in this hour? Have you realized the excuses that our precious brothers have, sincere brothers, but have you realized the, the excuses they have, why they got vaccinated? Oh, because then I won't be able to go travel. You think that's how you love the Redeemer? But I'm going to lose my job. Why do people make this mistake? Because they don't know what hour they're living in. Because they think that we're exaggerating. May the Lord help us to remain, brothers. Brother Branham said that the pressure would, would be so intense that many would not be able to resist. That's the hour that we're living in. <coughs> now, my daughter, fear not. I will do to thee all that thou requirest. For all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. Verse 12. And now, it is true that I am thy near kinsman. Howbeit there is a kinsman nearer than I. So here is where the prophet is revealing. He says, there's another kinsman, the devil. Tarry this night, and it shall be in the morning that if he will perform unto thee the part of a kinsman, well, let him do the kinsman's part. But if he will not do the part of a kinsman to thee, then will I do the part of a kinsman to thee. As the Lord liveth, lie down until the morning. Will Satan want to return to me the things that Adam lost? He can't. He's a poor devil. The question, if the devil wants to redeem me? No, he can't redeem anybody. What is he going to redeem you with? He can't even redeem himself. This is the revelation to Ruth. This isn't a revelation for the rest. This is for Ruth. If the devil wants to redeem you, Ruth, fine. But if he doesn't want to, I will redeem you. You know the story. No, the devil has a right over me. The devil has no right over you. The devil has a right over this, but I'm talking about the one in here, inside the eternal attribute of God. This is the redeemed one. So that's what you know. And what if the devil, what if the devil, what do you, what do you mean the devil? No devil. So we know. That's why the Bible is written. If the devil can redeem you, let him redeem you, but the devil cannot redeem you. Glory to the Lord. Verse 14, And she lay at his feet until the morning, and she rose up before one could know another. Now she slept. How long she slept? I don't know. How long did it take her to actually sleep? I don't know. What she must have dreamed when she slept. <laughs> what peace must have been in her heart? And she rose up before one could know another. And he said, let it not be known that a woman came into the floor. So no one knew what was happening. That's why, brother, we talk about Revelation. Where do you think we get that the one that enters into the Holy of Holies eats of the manna of the golden pot and receives the white stone that no man knoweth save he that receiveth it? Who knew that Ruth was there with, with Boaz, that Ruth had a conversation with Boaz? No one. Only Ruth and Boaz. Who do you think you are? You think you have a greater revelation? Who do you think you are? Well, I spent the night with Boaz. He said, he's my redeemer. He said, he's going to marry me. He already gave me his promise. I'm already his, his woman, his wife. You know, marriage promise means marriage. It means that she received the name. And if she received the name, what does it mean that she received the stone and in the stone a, a new name? And if she received a new name, she had to have already in with him. Do you know what that's what it means? Shouldn't it be at the end of the seventh decade? All of this is connecting. Glory to the Lord. Verse 15. Also he said, Bring the veil that thou hast upon thee and hold it. And when she held it, he measured six measures of barley and laid it on her, and she went into the city. Six measures of barley. Barley, again, what is that? Resurrection. 
But six is not complete. Seven is completion. So, almost about to have the full resurrection. Isn't barley resurrection? Aren't we waiting for the earthquake of resurrection? What was left? Only the earthquake is left. Already has six measures. Healing and the promise of resurrection. Just a little bit is left. Wait a little bit. Aren't we there? Exactly there? Living off of the six measures of barley? Right before the resurrection takes place, the earthquake of the resurrection? And when she came to her mother-in-law, we're closing now. And when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, Who art thou, my daughter? And she told her all that the man had done to her. And she said, These six measures of barley gave he me. For he said to me, Go not empty unto thy mother-in-law. Then said she, Sit still, my daughter, until thou know how the matter will fall. For the man will not be in rest until he have finished the thing this day. Amen. Now, who did all depend on? Was there something for Ruth to do? Nothing. Is there anything that we can do in this hour? Rest. Sit still. He will do everything through us. There's nothing for us. What if, what if, what if, if what if what? All the things that are happening in this hour, of all the things, he is taking care of them. So there's no reason to worry. Our only desire should be to please our Lord. That's it. Amen? Now, look. I read to you the book of Deuteronomy. And it says there that if Boaz, the kinsman, would not have wanted to redeem her, do you know Naomi, or Ruth rather, could have gone to the elders. You know she had that right? She could have gone to the elders and said, I went to my kinsman, Boaz, and I asked him to redeem, and if he didn't want to, do you know what she could have done? We know that's not a picture that happens, but she could have lost his shoe and spit in his face. You know how he secured that promise for us? If I don't redeem you, you can take off my shoe and spit on my face. Can you imagine Ruth doing that? Can you imagine us doing that to the Lord? It's impossible for me not to redeem you. What we will do is you're going to take off the shoe of the other one of the such a one and spit in the face of that one the devil we can do that to the devil that's the security we have but not to Jesus Jesus exposed himself to that when he brought the word but that's to give us security you understand what I'm saying brothers you understand that all right let's leave it there it's been an hour I hope that to you it has been a blessing as it has been for me as well. Musicians, come here. Song service leader. I was going to read some quotes here, but the hour already won here. What things are there kept? Our blessed Lord Jesus Christ, we bow our heads to you at the end of this meeting to give you thanks for this precious time that we can gather around your presence. Lord, we just spoke a little bit in this hour, in this day, and upon finding all these expressions in the book of Ruth and the comments that you allow us to make, how wonderful this book becomes, how real it becomes to us. How much confidence begins to be edified because this book was made so that our faith would rise in our hearts. That we would have security of the hour that's taking place in this day. 
when the purchase, we can speak of the purchase as an event that took place 2,000 years ago. We can speak of the intercession mediation as an event that has already finished, that you, the mediator, have come down from glory, and that now that work of intercession is unfolding in the heart of your bride on the earth. There is no more intercession in heaven. The throne of mercy moved. The mercy seat moved to the heart of the bride. You left the heavenly sanctuary to come and, and be uh, and turn from lamb to lion. We give you thanks because we can understand these things. Because every time they become clearer to us. Oh, Father, we give you thanks for showing us, Lord, this wonderful type of Ruth, understanding the revelation, the understanding of revelation increasing. That's how we come this hour, knowing, Lord, that our name, our names have been spoken, knowing that's why Ruth, in the book of Revelation, chapter 5, that's why she could, she could sing to the Lamb, sing to Boaz, and say, only you are worthy. You have redeemed us from every tongue, nation, kindred. You've made us into kings and priests, and we'll reign with you. That's what Ruth sang, because I will marry you, because I will live with you. We'll be owners of the same things. I'll be Mrs. Boaz. When the book was taken, when the book was opened, that is our experience, Lord. We give you thanks, Father. We commend ourselves to you now so that in the midst of the situation that we may be in, be it a health problem, economic problem, if it's a family problem, even so, may we be sure of what you said. Fear not, my daughter. I will do what everything that thou requirest. Keep us, Lord. Keep us faithful to you. We ask you for every servant of yours in the fivefold ministry. Anoint our eyes. Keep us attentive, Lord, that we may bring the appropriate word for your people. That we may be so aligned, so in contact with you, that we may receive from you what you want your people to receive as well. Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, amen and amen. God bless you, my brothers. Until next meeting. Hallelujah. Gracias Padre Agradezca al Señor, amén Hemos venido Señor A refugiarnos Bajo tu sombra Aleluya Sí, Padre Cuando fatigado Me he sentido mi Señor Y mi gozo ha desfallecido Mi confianza he puesto En lo que eres mi Señor Al oír tu voz Una gran roca de poder Cuando fatigado me he sentido mi Señor Y mi gozo ha desfallecido Mi confianza he puesto en lo que eres mi Señor Al oír tu voz Una gran roca de poder Tu voz ha sido mi esperanza En tiempos de angustia y desazón He corrido a tu sombra 
angustia y desazón He corrido a tu sombra para refugiarme en ti Quiero escuchar tu voz muy dentro de mí Hemos venido a tu presencia Padre cuando pase el tiempo de problemas Tú me has prometido estar cerca Junto a aguas de reposo me pastorearás mi Señor Nada me faltará Destino, 
Él me predestinó, gracias Cristo. 